So there is a gentleman good evening. This is the Italian Institute of Culture. I see some new faces, so I will explain a little bit. The Italian Institute of Culture is an institution of the Italian government, which was created uh, in 1870. And this is the first institute in the world, because Italy and Egypt have shared a lot of history, and this was the main place uh, which the Italian government, at that time the Kingdom of Italy, wanted to open. And it is one of the best institutes in the world of the Italian network. And I am the regional director for MENA region. And uh, this evening we do a lot of things, and there are programs maybe. And uh, if any of you are interested in uh, having our program, I would be delighted to share with you my, my telephone number and my website uh, so you can participate. And this evening we have a very special occasion, and uh, Professor Ibrahim Karim is here with us. He's, uh, as everybody knows, is a very famous person, and this is the honor of the Institute to have you here, to have you here. And how did I meet Professor Karim? In a very strange way. I am very fond of radiesthesy, of how to go to magnetic field and how to perceive the magnetic radiation of the Earth and so on and so forth. It is kind of quote-unquote magic, but actually it is a science. And so, uh, once I was talking to the, the president of the Italian Associa Association of Radiesthesists and Drug Commands, and uh, said, I don't know anyone, and so on. And so she said, uh, from here, uh, I was calling her, and she said, come on, you are in Egypt, and you are in contact with Professor Ibrahim Karim. Well, I said, yes, yeah. And so I went to the internet, and I uh, contacted the, the company of Professor Karim, and uh, he answered to me in Egypt. And so this is a real, a real like a magic and fairy tale, because he can hear, he donated to me his book, the book which we are presenting this evening, translated into and so, uh, I had a kind of magic and spiritual adventure reading that book. And that's why I propose to Professor Kulinga that he would comment his book, The Italian Missouri Culture, so he read this. And thank you very much for coming, and I don't want to uh, profit so much of your time, and I need you to know very quickly. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Paolo, non direttore. Uh, well, before I start my presentation, I would like to present uh, two people who made this book possible in Italian. So we have Madame Garcia da Sanoletti. She was voted as the number one businesswoman in uh, Switzerland, but she is also a very big humanitarian person. She has the Friends of Humanity Foundation, but she's also president of My Job to Europe. So she took the charge of publishing this book, and Taraka, her daughter, please. Uh, <laughs> she did uh, the translation. Now, if I speak Italian, you wouldn't be very happy hearing me. So, so I will let uh, Graciela say a few words and Taraka say a few words about the book because they are the ones who uh, did the translation. Buonasera. Italian. Change the moods. But I think that Italian. Gli egiziani capiscono bene tutti e due, credo. Ci sono molti egiziani in Italia e viceversa. Eh, volevo solo aggiungere una cosa a quello che ha detto Ibrahim, è che non si può rifiutare al suo maestro l'obbedienza. Quindi quando lui mi disse adesso che hai imparato la biogeometria devi diventare la responsabile dello sviluppo della biogeometria in Europa, non ho potuto fare nient'altro che accettarlo. E per quello che mi trovo in questa posizione e un'altra cosa aggiungo 
è che sono stata molto felice, un momento molto privilegiato nella mia vita quando mia figlia mi ha chiesto di, mi ha detto di sì, sì lo traduco, questo libro, perché per me ha cambiato la mia vita. Ti ringrazio di essere qui. messages in this book because there are a few things in this book that I feel are very important messages that I want to convey through the book. So after some slides like that, you know I put the slides so that I don't sleep while I'm speaking. That's the reason I put the slides but otherwise after that I like to speak without them. So now this the first one this shows a bit about my, work, um, it, my profession is an architect, so I'm an architect, and uh, this shows a bit one of the pictures taken uh, two days ago. Uh, <laughs> 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 okay, sorry. Okay, one of the things I do, I'm uh, an architect and a tourist planner tourism planning and the uh, uh, most important work in this uh, respect was the planning of the Red Sea region but not because we planned the Red Sea region the, the whole idea was uh, to introduce the industrialization of tourism in Egypt, the industry of tourism and uh, then when we tried to do that, it was in the 80s uh, you know we look at tourism with a lot of pride that we have a lot of culture, we have the pyramids, we have the temples, so we concentrate on cultural tourism. We didn't go out and see what the world wants, so for years we've been concentrating on cultural tourism, so uh, I wanted to apply my uh, profession. I took my doctor's degree in tourist planning, so I came and said tourism is an industry, so we start by studying what the others want, not what we have. So, when you study what the others want, you're going to find that ten times as many people want the sand on the beach 
than actually going to see the pyramids. But we have to accept that. If you want to make an industry, you have to see what the people want. So if you cater those people, you're going to get 10 times as many tourists in Egypt. And that's industry, industrialization of tourism. It took a lot of convincing, uh, especially where I thought I had a 12-month season, uh, it was actually a strategic area, because that was uh, in the beginning of the 80s, and this was still more a strategic area after the 73 war and all that. And we chose that area because I told them, this is the only area that has a 12-month season, and where the Europeans can come in winter. So it took years, years of fighting and all that until we developed uh, the tourism on the Red Sea. Now, of course, uh, to everybody it's normal. Everybody knows there's a lot of tourism on the Red Sea. But we had so many obstacles. First of all, we had to get charter planes. And they didn't want charter planes in Egypt, and we had to have charter planes. So this took a fight of its own. So every little uh, step along the way was a bit uh, of struggle. And I'm proud to say that now this has become an everyday thing. Okay. Nothing. That's it. That's nothing. Next one. <laughs> okay. Now, here we're going to tackle three main things. We're going to tackle the environment because now you see we had the World Environment Summit. So we have to speak about the environment, because I have some uh, point of views that they don't respect even in the summit, and I would like to stress on them. And then uh, we'll show you some research and applications in biogeometry, and then we're going to speak about the earth energy power spots, because these are very important in the history of humankind. Okay, now, Speaking about the environment, we go to the summit, they speak mainly about global warming. I think all of you looked at uh, some programs about it, but the main concentration is on global warming because that's the biggest threat that faces the Earth, faces life on Earth, is global warming. Now, the summit concentrates only on carbon gases. See, as if this is the thing that if we don't master, life will end on Earth. But if you look here, you, do you see how much uh, electromagnetic radiation here exists on Earth through travel, airplanes, how much electromagnetic radiation? Can we have the next slide, please? See here, that's Egypt. How much electricity is there now? Electromagnetic radiation, as you know, is used in your microwave. You use it to heat food. So why should it, in, in the microwave, heat food and in the atmosphere not have an effect on global warming? Anything that moves will move air. And anything that moves will produce heat. Because when air moves, there's friction. Friction produces heat. So, every child can understand that electromagnetic radiation is a huge cause for global warming. And the problem is that with the carbon gases, we can reduce them. But with electromagnetic radiation, we are going from emitting carbon gases and going to electricity. We say we're going to build smart cities with electricity. We're going to build electric cars and all that. It's, you're just uh, switching levels. I mean, instead of working with this one, you're working with the other one, you see. It took us, uh, in the age of industrialization, it took us a hundred years to realize that the age of modern technology is at the expense of humankind now. I hope it doesn't take us another hundred years to discover that the age of information with electromagnetic radiation is at our expense because with the age of information and the speed at which new technologies are coming out, we don't have a hundred years. 
So, some people would say, no, it, it, you, what you're saying is wrong because in the microwave, it's a closed space, you know, but here it's open. Well, your atmosphere is a closed space. See? So it's the same, it's just bigger. So, we have here uh, a huge problem because civilizations can end with only with things you do not know or do not acknowledge. We know that nuclear warfare can end civilization. Probably we'll deal with that, since we know it. We know now that carbon uh, emissions and all that would have uh, an effect, a negative effect on life. So we can deal with it. Everything we know, we can deal with. But if there is something we don't know, or we pretend not to know, or uh, the industry doesn't want us to know, it's all the same. It's all the same. So, that's when civilization can end. When something comes because you do not acknowledge the harm. So, we go further on. Look at what we are doing. Transportation, trains, cars, planes, ships, hybrid cars, uh, wireless and wireless, globe, all that plus global warming. Now, you sit. We said, if electricity, electromagnetic radiation is bad for you. You know how many electromotors are under the seat of your car? If I tell you, <laughs> you won't sit in your car. There are between 15 and 20 small electromotors in the seat of your car. When you're not moving the seat, they're still alive. Now, in the inside of a car, the more poshy the car is, the more electromotors you have. So in a, a high-end car, you have between 180 and 200 electromotors hidden inside the plastic of the car. So you are sitting in this sort of electromagnetic environment and it is killing you. Whether you like it or not, it's killing you. And when you sit on this uh, seat of your car, now, from the knee here, maybe to the shoulders here, that's the distribution of the electromotors. So all your organs between here and here, they're affected. So, now we're saying we want everything to be electric, we want everything to be electric. Okay, what do you want to do? You want to save uh, the environment from gases and, and kill the users? <laughs> okay. Next one. These are, I don't want to go into uh, is electromagnetic radiation harmful or not. Unfortunately, one out of ten people I meet knows that electromagnetic radiation is harmful. The others they don't believe that it's harmful. And they tell me, well, I have television, I have my mobile, I have everything. I my health is perfect and all that. It's, uh, so it's a problem. 90% of people don't acknowledge it. That's where the problem is. In biogeometry, we do not want to concentrate on where the harm is coming from. We want to concentrate on providing solutions. So I didn't put any slides that show you uh, thousands of researchers around the world on the harm it does to us. But I just put uh, three websites you can go to if anybody is interested in having uh, official research that shows what electromagnetic radiation can do to the human body. I put three sites there that could help you. WHO has acknowledged it, many governments have acknowledged it. So uh, they acknowledge it, but the problem is uh, they don't really deal with the problem properly. I'll tell you uh, a very simple uh, example. <coughs> An example to show that we need to teach people more awareness about the dangers of electromagnetic radiation. Now, when somebody puts a tower on your house, a mobile tower, 
or right in front of you. You panic. What should I do? We receive phones every day. Uh, Ibrahim, can you help us? They put mobile tower there. It's going to kill us. It's going to kill us. Cancer and all that. Okay. And then you go to sleep. You put your head on the pillow. And behind your head in the wall, there's a cable on the height of your head. There's an electric cable in the wall. And it has about 50 to 60 centimeters electromagnetic field. So every night, you put your head to be charged. In their life, you charge your phone, you charge your head. Now the problem is you are putting the two most important glands inside there. You're putting your pineal and your pituitary. Your pituitary is the master gland of hormones in your body, so you can get all kinds of uh, hormone-related uh, diseases. And your pineal is uh, your melatonin producer, serotonin producer, and all that. So when serotonin goes low, you get depressions and all that. When melatonin goes low, you don't sleep. And then uh, uh, there are also, in mel with melatonin, you have tumor suppressors in there, so you have no defense against tumors in your body and all that. You know, if you just go away from there, or if we learn that instead of having electric cables on a height of about 40 centimeters or 50 from the ground, if I put them on the height of the door in the apartment and whenever I need to go down, I go down, I'm safe because it's, the field is about 50 centimeters. So that means we lack awareness. We have to teach the architects, the engineers and all that. We have to teach awareness of how to interact with electromagnetic fields. Now, okay, let us go further on. This one. Uh, then we have radioactivity. We think that we can irradiate our food and it won't harm us. We tell you, there's always, our problem is always limits. We say, below such a limit, it won't harm. It won't harm. So you irradiate your food to increase the shelf life of foods. So we are eating irradiated foods. Okay, you irradiate one foot below the limits. But I'm not eating one foot, I'm eating thousands of different That's why you see it. Okay, that's radioactivity. So, we are irradiating foot with radioactivity. Then, all, we're doing so many wars. And then we go out of any region, and the whole, whole earth there, is radioactive, we have weak radioactivity. And people, for centuries later, they have all those health problems within those areas. And if you see now around the world, how many countries have had wars, you'll know that Earth radiation, I mean, not the Earth radiation, but Earth uh, nuclear radiation is increasing tremendously everywhere. So, our building materials, I could look at this room like that and show you how much radiation comes from the building material. I can show you radioactivity in so many places. Of course, I haven't analyzed it, but for example, you could have radioactivity in your paint. You could have radioactivity on the wall paints. You could have radioactivity in synthetic materials. You could have radioactivity in your ceramics in the bathroom. The, the glaze, the glaze of ceramics in many uh, time is, uh, cases is radioactive. You could have radioactivity uh, in dark granites, for example. So, a large part of our building environment is also radioactive. But we always say, is very little, very minute. Now we ask the companies, why don't you test every building material? Why don't we have it tested and write on it how much radioactivity is in it? The consumer has the right to know. But nobody does that, of course. What's the next? 
all of this shows that we have a problem. The way we deal with any form of environmental pollution is to reduce it. That's the mentality, that's our paradigm, the way we think. Now, with electricity, it doesn't work. Because with electricity, we are putting 100 times more electromagnetic radiation up there every year or every day or every second. We are, and uh, we are saying we are limiting the power, but we are increasing the inventions. We are putting this and this and so. It's unending. If you look at how many satellites are around the Earth, you're going to see it's, uh, it's like uh, a garbage can up there. You know, around the Earth, it's full of garbage floating <laughs> around the Earth with electromagnetic radiation. So, can we go? So you see, we have, with all what I said, then you understand that we have a hidden time bomb in the age of information. We don't know when it will explode, how it will explode, but we could wake up one morning and see that the best medicine doesn't help us because our immune systems are just not responding. See? And Another thing about uh, electromagnetic radiation that we're going to go into now, it's negative effects on your emotions, on your mental state, on your, even on your morals. It's very, very strong, even stronger than on the physical. The interpersonal relationships between people, the aggressiveness, uh, the way you perceive life, your happiness, the way you enjoy your life and all that. All that can be affected by electromagnetic radiation. So, let's go further. Let's go further. Okay. So, when we say back to the future for mankind, why did I choose this title? Because I asked myself, where did we go wrong? Where at what time did we decide to start an age of technology, of scientific development that went wrong and is at our expense at the end? Well, the main concept of a scientific experiment is keeping the human being out of it because you want objectivity, you don't want subjectivity because the human being is subjective. <coughs> So you want to keep him out of the experiment. Okay? That's step one. When you reach now step million, where the whole wo world is living on inventions based on this first step, what happens is the human being is out. Modern science is at his expense because he was never part of the formula. See, if I had tested in the beginning, if I had said, no, with every experiment, every invention, I want the human being to be part of, the of that experiment. He has to be part of it, I have to evaluate him with it, we wouldn't be where we are. So, when things get so mixed up, the right thing to do, you know, is go from the beginning. Go from the beginning, try to understand all that. So, we ask ourselves, how come great civilizations like ancient Egypt and all that, they lasted for 3,000 years of known history. They might have been there even 10,000 years before. And our cycle of civilizations now is about between 300 and 400 years. The ups and downs of civilization, they must have known better. You know? And then, when, when you read about Herodotus when he came to Egypt 500 uh, BC, he said, I haven't seen anywhere in the world people who are healthier, happier, and more religious than the Egyptians. <coughs> when he speaks more religious, it's not that religious in the sense that of today. It's a different kind of religion. Uh, that they were in harmony with all the forces of nature. That's the kind of religion. That's why they were healthy, and that's why they were uh, happy. So imagine 
there was a time, but that was at the end of that civilization, where Egyptians were the healthiest and the happiest. Where is that today? So, there is something wrong. So that's why we have to go back. That's why I said back. In order to find the future, I have to go back and see why were the Egyptians the happiest? Where, why were they the healthiest? What did they do? How? The main thing, don't ask yourself, what did they do? Ask yourself, how did they see the world? What was their worldview? If we go in their mind and see how they saw the world, we might find the key. So, I found through research that when I started developing the science of bijointry as an architect, that was the energy of shape and all that, I found myself slowly uh, and having a similar way of thinking like the ancient Egyptians. Or like I think the ancient Egyptians had. Because when I speak about ancient Egypt, I speak about my ancient Egypt. Not the Egyptologist's ancient Egypt. Because the Egyptologist's ancient Egypt is, uh, you read in the books how it is and all that, that's not my ancient Egypt. My ancient Egypt is, I want to see what is behind all that. I want to see the invisible Egypt. I want to see the invisible energy that goes out all those people. And I think that when I show you the results of what we can do today, and I have uh, developed by geometry now, if I look back, uh, 45 years now. I've been working with my geometry for 45 years. I started when I was two years old, by the way. <laughs> so, 45 years, any achievement I've made, I should know that people who have done the same thing with geometrical shapes for 4,000 years must have done a thousand times much more than I did. And the way of thinking that I needed to understand the science of the world, they must have had it in a very, very advanced manner. So, I couldn't develop my geometry or develop the science for the future, because when I say back to the future, you cannot go back and learn something. There is no way. For example, if you, the ancient Egyptians, were making brain operations about 4,000 years ago. Now, we looked at it and we say, okay, that this is mythology, of they were opening his head, it would represent something like that. While you had separate papyrus that showed you operations and things like that, but of course you can't. Uh, with our modern medicine 50 years ago or 40 years ago, you can't uh, imagine that they did complex brain operations. But when we learned how to do it, then we went back and saw how they did it. So it's the same thing with bijometry. Uh, many people ask me, did you go and learn bijometry from the ancient Egyptians? You can't learn anything from anybody. You have to learn by experience. You develop your own science in a modern way. The ancient Egyptians didn't have electricity, they didn't have radioactivity, they didn't have all that. So bijometry is a modern science that deals with those things, but somehow it ended up, after I developed it, more and more in the, let's say, worldview or paradigm of what I think the temple sciences were like. You could tell me they, they were not like that. The ancient Egyptians couldn't do that. But I'll show you as we go along that it's very important to rediscover their worldview to save ourselves. Because only their worldview will save us. So, here, well, I already said all that. And 
Now, there's a few things that I want to touch in ancient Egypt. First, working with the laws of nature. Because it's very easy for us to say they had multiple gods. The letters were gods and they had multiple gods. And then we get stuck into their beliefs. They, they were uh, worshipping uh, so many gods and things like that. And instead of going deeper and understanding, the word letter doesn't mean God. NTR for letter. Letter is the root for nature. So letter is a nature power, an intelligent nature power. So they could be like the divine names today, they could be like the angels, they could be that, but these were the powers of nature and the laws of nature. So people who saw the laws of nature as sacred, that is the whole story. Nature is sacred. <coughs> see, in biogeometry, we teach you one thing and you're going to see in the book that when you perceive the reality outside, you're actually interacting with divine light. See, your heart is the fire center of your body, and where there is fire, there is light. Mm -hmm. So, your heart can resonate with any kind of light on a higher harmonic, not this light that you see. Now, the brain, to produce colors and all that, needs light, but it cannot produce colors if you are dead. So, your heart has to beat before your brain can see colors. That means, what is making your heart beat? The laws of the universe. The laws of the universe are making our heart beat daily. The heart is in resonance with the whole universe. Because there's no individuality until the heart beats. Because individuality is related to the senses. And the heart beats before you even have senses. So, the heart creates a light. This light interacts with resonance, like, you know, like tape of tapes and a piano, like that, with higher levels, at different levels until it enters into resonance with a level in the pineal plane. So we have one level of inner light. And then this level interacts with another level in the visual cortex in the back. And this is where you get the light that produces colors. And then at the end, you project reality outside. So we are actually working the laws of nature, the divine light and all that are working through us and then it's projected outside. So, unless you understand all those laws of nature, you will never understand that they are within you, they work through you, within you. You are using them. So, when somebody asks them, for example, where are the ancient Egyptian gods now? Where, where are the letters? I say within you. They, they're still alive in you. Because these are the laws of nature. In you. Like when somebody asks me, uh, where are the, the attributes of God, the divine names of God? They're in you. Because these are every name, every attribute is a law. It's a law of nature. So it has to be in you. It has to work through you. So then, in order that everything works perfectly, you have to understand all those attributes, all those laws of nature, and they become then, for you, sacred. So you can call them, the, the nature powers are sacred. They're not, it's not different from the modern concept that angels are sacred. Angels are intelligent nature powers, but so are the letters. So, if somebody can reach this height of civilization by looking at the laws of nature as sacred, by respecting them, and looking at them sacred, and bringing them into every action of life, this is what we need to make to save our civilization. But what we've done here, we have superimposed like an electric or electromagnetic web 
on nature. So now, the future development of the Earth is developing according to electromagnetic interaction that is becoming stronger than the actual laws of nature. And that's why we're getting this disruption everywhere. So we learn from the ancient Egyptians. Maybe we should find the laws of nature and look at them as sacred instead of destroying them. So, go to the next one. Okay. My job to today is we're lucky to have done in 45 years that we are acknowledged in Egypt uh, alone here. We have about uh, 20 students who took their doctor's degrees in both university in biogeometry in different fields, uh, starting from town planning to architecture to uh, uh, mental problems to psychological problems to textiles to furniture and everything. So uh, it has developed to be academically acknowledged. And we've done uh, projects all over the world. The way we work with biogeometry is, I don't explain, you know when you have a new science, you can't explain it, because every new science, the moment you explain it, people will tell you, no, it's not like that, it's like that. You can't, you enter into endless discussions. My way of looking uh, at problems in the world, I always say, for example, when somebody say we have a problem, like in Switzerland, uh, they had problems of electrosensitivity, so I tell them, okay, uh, why don't you solve it? Why come to me? If modern science can solve it, then don't come to me because I don't have time. I have other more important things to do, researching new solutions. But then they tell you, yes, but we have no solution. Okay, then don't ask me about how my job to works. Just tell me, solve the problem. If I solve it successfully, then ask me, how does my job to actually work? If I don't solve it, you don't have any need to, to ask me anyhow. So, any new science, and that's a very important thing, we do not need new science, new methodologies uh, at this moment in life that do not actively play a role in solving our greatest threats to humanity. Any science today that doesn't do that, we don't really uh, need it. We are at a time where imminent death is coming soon. We want to save ourselves. So we need science that address that. sciences of all energy sciences and all that that's actually not very much different from uh, modern medicine it's just another level but the paradigm the way they think is exactly the same and that is any uh, disease or any problem is an excess of function or a lack of function overactivity or underactivity that, that, that's simplifying any problem. So if it is over function, we give it something to calm it. If it's under function, we give it something to give it the other side. That's what you do in any type of treatment. For that, you have to do uh, your work. You have to study, understand and all that because uh, to work with dualities, you have to, to know the doses you're working with. If you have overactivity and you give something to bring it down, you don't want to keep bringing it down forever. And the opposite is true. So that's why there's dosage is important. That is the way of uh, we think of solving problems. But then, I'm just an architect, you know. Simple architect. I, I don't understand all this. So, we go into architecture and see 
how does architecture deal, or in the history of architecture, we find the temples that are there since ages and ages, and people go to the temples for healing, and people go, uh, they go there for worship and all that, but healing was an important part of the temples. Now, in architecture, I say, okay, there's energy involved. So, if I apply the laws of energy, medicine to architecture, then when I build the house, I'm going to write on the bedroom, uh, I'm going to put calming energy here, so uh, the dosage here is uh, 6 hours, 52 minutes, and 30 seconds. So you can't sleep more than that, you'll, be, you'll have an overdose on the other side. In the living room, uh, I put an activating thing, and then I put in the living room, you can stay 4 hours, 10 minutes, and 12 seconds. So it, that, it's not practical, you can't work bringing this energy concept in architecture doesn't work. But then I, I say, but people go in the temple and one who has low blood pressure gets normalized. One who has high blood pressure gets normalized in the same place. And if he stays there for a year, he'll get better. So there's something different. There is a certain energy quality and that is the concept that we call here on the left centering. Centering means that imagine a circle and you want to find the center of the circle. The center of the circle is always beyond time and space because if the circle turns, the center never turns, it's always beyond time and space. So that would be the place where dosage does not exist in the center of the circle, but the center of the circle is just a point. How can I use a point? And then when I go to the point and say, this is the center, I make it a bit bigger, it has a center. I make it a bit bigger, it has a center. So the center is elusive, it doesn't exist in time and space. So it's the quality. Now, if I can make this quality, if I resonate with it, and make this quality come out like a fountain and fill the space, that means I have a center everywhere, adjusting everything. That's what we call centering. So, in sacred power spots or in sacred uh, monuments all over the world when people go uh, for healing, there must be the centering effect because it's not just a point where you go and stand on it. It's a whole area. So the principle of the centering effect is what uh, you find in those places. So I started asking myself, what's then more important? We've been teaching architecture for, I don't know, so many years, and always saying, look at the style, and look at this, and the style, and uh, the, this is, uh, a Mamluki thing and this is another thing and like that but I asked myself what's behind all that okay the styles are that these are the physical things but why do those people always go and build on the same spots there must be a reason you go to Luxor and you find the ancient temple of Luxor and then inside there you find the church and inside there you find the mosque if you go to any, uh, let's say, not modern building, but a bit older than three, four hundred years, and then you come to this uh, monument and maybe dig under it, maybe you dig ten meters, you'll find traces of another civilization. And then you go deeper, you find another civilization. Then you ask yourself, why do they have to go on the same spot, all of them? So, all of a sudden, you realize that maybe it's the area and not the monuments. Maybe this area has something special in the hearts of the people there and not the monument is just to mark the area, but it is not the area. So, to discover the quality of this energy, the centering quality, we develop the physics of quality.
that's not physics quantity, but quality. Quality means what affects you. This quality is the word quality, or even the word energy, means effect. So we have a new physics, the physics of quality, where the human being is at the center. You measure everything on the human being. And that was badly needed, having the human being at the center of future science. Now, when you do that, and you have physical quality, you can actually use it as a key to transform every uh, thing that you used to call the arts, you transform it into a science because you can actually affect the energy of life with it, you can affect the human being with it. You have new values, you see, that you can use. So all of a sudden, you have a key. Music gets a new dimension. I'll come to that later, because if I go into music, I'll take very long time to speak about it. But uh, I have to say a few things, because uh, uh, the director Paolo here is a musician and a piano player, so we have to do some speak about some music together. special in those areas. So let's go back and see how all this started. Why did they build the temple there? Why did they, what did the human beings have? You know, like I said, when everything gets mixed up, we go back to the beginning. So we go back to the beginning, and what do we find when we go back? That the early, even cavemen, they found those spots on earth and mark them with huge megalithic stones. And sometimes those stones were maybe uh, 100 tons. And it was mostly, it was important, those stones had to be quartz, <coughs> like granite and things like that, that had high content, high density, a lot of quartz. So you ask yourself, then they chose the stone that had the capability of resonating with this energy. If they couldn't find this stone, imagine a caveman going 500 kilometers to bring such a stone from a mountain, so the whole tribe had to go, and it might take them maybe six, seven years until they bring it down, cut trees, put it on the trees, and go make a raft, go in the water and bring it. Like here in, in Egypt, for example, the granite that you see here comes from the swamp. 500 kilometers away. So we find that all over the world. So you ask yourself, if they went through so much trouble to erect this, this spot must have been very important for them. Actually, if I jump from there to civilizations, I find, can we go to the next one? Okay. We find the Egyptian obelisks were erected on those spots. But now, instead of the old man here, which was just a stone, the Egyptian here brought loads of mathematics, loads of geometry, loads of things. And so what was just a megalithic stone developed into an obelisk, or a temple, or a huge statue. And all those were actually put, it's very important, they were put on one of those uh, energy power spots. And they irradiated them. See. Next one. Well, I, I have a word to say about the obelisk, bring uh, back the obelisk. You know why they took all the obelisks away from Egypt and find them all over the world? Now, the ancient way of building communities and cities was linked to the earth. You had a power spot that became sacred to them, sacred power spots. Why did it become sacred? 
because there was something very strange in those parcels. Besides having uh, healing capabilities in those areas, that you saw when the animals went there in the beginning, you, you noticed they went there when they were sick and they came back healthy. So there was a healing aspect. But then they also found that when they went there, there was some form of strange communication to other dimensions, like angelic con connections or things like that in those spots. So to them, those spots became places of oracles and great places of knowledge, oracles and all that. So they became, for humanity, sacred. So these were the sacred cosmos of humanity, and then they built their communities around those power spots. Now when they built their communities there, later on as you developed into the cities uh, of later civilizations, you had power spots, and then you look for another power spot, and the third power spot, to now you're building a city, and then you connect the, the power spots together. So then you have the main squares of the new city, and then you have the main avenues of the new city, because city plan was nothing else but the distribution of this sacred light. So you plan the architect, plan with light, distribution of light. Now, later on, when they built cities uh, like Paris, Rome, Washington, and even Cairo, they built them according to the old rules, but some things were missing, some knowledge was missing. Like, you, you make uh, a device, but it's not working, because you didn't have all the rules. Now, they built the city, they built the connections and all that, but where is the light going in there? Something must resonate and bring it up, but it must have special proportions, special things and all that. So, I need the central battery to bring the city alive. Well, if I can't make it, if I don't have the knowledge, I know those who have it. See? So, let's go to Egypt and take the obelisks and put them in those centers, because once I put the obelisk there, it's like, if you imagine light, it becomes alive. And the energy goes through the whole city. But they didn't have the knowledge anymore, so they took all the obelisks from Egypt and did that. So an obelisk is something that had to do with the center in the earth. The temple had to do with the center in the earth because that's how it became alive. And when you read, for example, that they said uh, the temple uh, becomes the house of the living matter, of the living, we call it the living God, but it's actually now we know it's the living forces of nature. Why do they say that? Because it is on, a, on this power spot, this multidimensional portal, this power spot. Now, what happens when people come and take away the temple from the power spot and put it somewhere else? And that's what we did. Saving temples is just taking them from one place, putting them else. Because we think the temple is the most important and don't understand that the earth and the special energy is more important. So, out of ignorance maybe, we did so many blunders to the ancient monuments by taking them off the roads and putting them places where there is no sacred energy and all that because of our ignorance. Because the ancients looked for the spot before the building. We saw only something for the first to come and visit. If you understand the importance of those spots, you see, in your country, when you're born, let's say, in a country like here in Egypt, you have energy centers also like that, spiritual centers in your body. Those spiritual centers are in resonance with, like, internal notes of music in resonance with the power spots in your area. Now, you don't acknowledge them, you spoil them, you forget them out of your history, then your communication with the earth there is lost, and you are lost with it. So, I would like to see the day when you go to the pyramids, understand that this is a 
the sacred power spots. Understand that here you should say a prayer when you go in. Not just think, look at the stones, look at the pyramids, look at that. No, this is a sacred place. So, but if you go today to a mosque or to a church, you say a prayer because it's the owners are still here, Christmas and not. But because the ancient Egyptians are not here anymore, we don't respect that those areas were the most important uh, uh, spiritual areas. If you look at the history of all the saints who traveled Egypt, and even the Holy Family when they came and traveled in Egypt, they moved from one spot to the other, where there was always an ancient Egyptian temple. So the same spots used in thousands of years by the ancient Egyptians were the same spots they moved from one to the other to the next and so on, you see. So the heart of a nation is its sacred power spots. Lose it and you lose your health, your sanity and you lose so many things. So a new science should address interacting with this harmonizing energy of the power spot we should bring it into every activity in our life. Then, you see, you can call that bringing in the energy that harmonizes, that balances every activity in your life is, is in itself a religious ritual. Because if we go and think, for example, I can arrange everything around me I have a mind, I can do everything. So I tell you, okay, but your senses see only 1% of humanity, but not of humanity, of energy, of the absolute energy. Your senses only perceive 1%. Now you want, with 1%, to put order in the 99%, it's not possible. In the sacred power spot, you are taking the universality of energy that when you bring into your system, your action, through your subconscious mind will automatically incorporate criteria that balance at the same time the 99%. So your action will get a form of, I call that excellence in action, perfection coming from the universe. Because like the ancient Egyptians, the letters are working with us in there, you see. So this is the way we want to uh, go forward. If you look at your work, if you look at anything, when people ask me what any religion in the world or any mystical tradition or anything, I have only one word to say. Any mystical tradition can be summed up for any religion in one word. Excellence. Excellence sums it. Bringing divine balance into physical action. What you need more than that. Now, that is exactly what the ancient Egyptians did. Now, call them what you like, they didn't have religion, did. do you need it? If you live in harmony with the forces of nature and bring excellence into every action because the forces of nature are working with you in there, and somebody asks you, comes and tells you, do you know, what is your religion? Do you believe what you believe? You are a one with everything, but you are a one with everything. So the question doesn't have a place because you're already one with the universe, you see. So that is uh, the par paradigm of the physics of quality here. The physics of quality is a new physics that brings the ancient laws of harmonics of resonance into science. So that, I'll give you uh, an example. Modern science is when you take a musical note, for example. Modern science can go in, can analyze the pitch, can analyze the frequency, can analyze, you can go into every detail, detail and analyze every note and know everything about it. Okay? Now, the ancient Egyptian way or this universal harmonic way would be let not you know everything about the note. <coughs> Let the note be aware of its place in the universal symphony. Its unity, its place. 
So then you tell me, how can the not become aware? <coughs> that is the whole secret, that the not becomes aware. Everything is aware. So even the note is aware of its place in the universal symptom. And you know why not only the note is aware of its place in the universal symphony, but the whole universe is aware of the place of the note. Now, how did that come? Because how did they discover notes? If you bring just a string and you turn it around like this, you see, the string will start dividing itself into half, into third, into third. It took one to certain proportions and it will go back. So if that is a normal thing that happens to any string, that it means division of frequencies into fixed proportions and coming back, this must be the law by which everything in the universe divides itself. So if I take a string and then put those dimensions on the string, and then I play any note, I'm entering into resonance with the laws of creation of the universe. So like the hermetic sciences, they said, we want to understand or live into the mind of God. Because then you understand. The note here is me becoming the universe. What you don't understand is, when I hear a musical note, do I become the universe? Yes. Become the universe. No, I'm listening to the note. Yes. Now this might seem you're already thinking that I'm crazy already. <coughs> you shouldn't think that I've been uh, crazy for a long time. It's nothing new. <laughs> it's nothing new. But that that is the ancient paradigm. That's the way of thinking that you, you, you saw the laws of nature first. You see, the difference between us and those ancient great sciences is if you are born in Italy, I'm saying Italy because uh, because Comandatore Paolo is Italian, so I'm saying Italy. If you are born in Italy and you live all your life in Italy and don't speak a word of Italian, okay, you are of no use to your society. Because you don't speak a word of Italian. You're no use to your society. Okay. You are born in nature. And the divine hand is drawing all the shapes in nature, and nobody reads. So, what are we doing? We speak to ourselves, we might speak to itself, like getting a mirror and speaking to myself. Well, nature is out there waiting for me to communicate, and I'm not even aware of it. Of course, nature is sad because a few thousand years ago, there were other human beings here who acknowledged it and who interacted with it, who spoke with it. And then comes a humanity that is deaf and doesn't see, doesn't hear. So that is, you will find, all this is in the world. Now I've taken a lot of time, I just want to show you uh, three examples of things that we did last, uh, this year that I think are uh, good. So let's choose, uh, or let's see the, the last project. Research magnetism center. I'll start one application. We have lots and lots of this research in there, but I'll start with something that I'm working on today. Okay. Now, for the past four years, uh, somehow many of the students uh, that were doing doctor's degrees with me uh, tackled problems related to architecture, but uh, to brain uh, problems like ADHD, ADD, or uh, depression, or diff different forms. Both. But I always, I had one doctor's degree after the other, one after the other, always in the past four years related to this. And we got fantastic results there. So, for example, we managed to raise the serotonin in the brain, uh, tested on animals, uh, better than any drug on the market just by putting some uh, 
uh, designs on the wall. You see, so you don't need to give drugs, no addiction, nothing. All you can raise the serotonin in the brain. That means you can fight depression. You can fight so many things just without lectures. So by doing, I'm just taking an example. So with all that research behind me, I didn't know that it was leading to something. Something was waiting for me when I came back here in Egypt uh, lately. I was asked to design a center for special abilities. So I started looking for a shape, a shape of a classroom, but I did it in the shape of an open pergola because I didn't want to spoil my garden. And I kept working with the angles in order to restore the balance in an unbalanced mind. It's not an unbalanced mind, it's a mind actually that has special abilities at the cost of some other abilities. So I wanted to bring balance into that. So we kept analyzing every shape, every color, everything to see what affects uh, those children, what affects their mind. We found, for example, something very strange, that every 90 degree angle produces a huge pressure on their mind. That's difficult because all our cultures, every room, every building is 90 degree angles. Another thing, I said, maybe the circles would, would be better. Every circle produces the same. So, I said, but those children are taking balls. Thing on the mind. So we kept researching, researching, until we gave a special angle, special material, it's a very long thing. And then I built this pavilion that you saw, so that people can come and test, the doctors can come and bring the children and test them, and we make brain tests and all that in there. And while doing that, that's the pavilion for testing, the research pavilion, we designed the project. Here, uh, the president has asked to build six huge centers for special abilities in Egypt. So two would be in the region here near Cairo, I think one in Alexandria, one in the middle somewhere, and one in the south. So we started using this new information to design special shapes that would restore uh, the functioning of the brains of those children. And that is the results we can see the next uh, that is one of those projects, you see. And with every location, it might change a bit. That is the actual classroom for age students. Now, with the brain research, show me the next one, the brain research. <coughs> next one. With the brain research, what we've been doing in Montreal uh, my son-in-law, the Ray's husband, Omar Rafat, is a uh, music composer. So we said, why don't we take all the rules of biogeometry and put them into a musical composition so that the musical composition would solve all the problems that have been solved with biogeometry. It would restore the balance on every organ of the body. It would, for example, the earth radiation that comes from the earth is the major cause of cancers and things like that, it would actually harmonize that. It would uh, balance the effect, the negative effect of electricity on the body, it would do that. So we stayed the whole year putting uh, proportions, not changing and things. I drove him crazy because uh, he wants to, <laughs> has to compose music in the normal way. And I was telling him things, uh, put uh, this note here and, and uh, leave a distance like this and put this and this and this and this and you know if he asks why and I explain by John oh, oh, he said no please don't explain <laughs> please. I just do it and then we do it and we do testing and then let's say we're testing by electricity and then it's 50% it's not 100% and then oh it's not working so it's like yes but uh, I don't know I, I mean I did what you said. I said, I know this. <laughs> it has to work somehow. So we kept going on for a whole year. <coughs> Until at the end, we came out with the series Odyssey, this CD that we played uh, here on the all outside. We played it. And if we played it, uh, 
now while we're leaving to see is how nice uh, everything was. We've done, uh, the last thing I want to show you is we've not only taken care of human health, uh, in Canada we work on uh, animals, animal farming, chicken, cows and all that. You know in chicken farming for example, there's so many things, antibiotics, drugs, vaccines, and I don't want to tell you all what goes into a chicken, but uh, we went and said, uh, okay, uh, we're going to make totally antibiotic free chicken. But then they say, yes, but we do organic chicken without antibiotics, but we take the antibiotics that affect the humans, but we leave therapeutic ones because those you take, so I tell them that you can't do that and say they are antibiotic free. They say, yes, we can. <laughs> okay, you can. Okay. But I said, no, we're going even to take away the vaccines and all that. They said, you'll kill all the chicken. I said, well, I mean, this biogeometry can actually restore the whole health of a chicken and the, its growth and all that through the immune system of, of the chicken. I don't need extra things from outside. So we did that. And uh, now when I'm back here, Doreya is actually uh, my chicken lady there. She takes care of the chicken uh, there. So she's been responsible for this project for three years now. And uh, fortunately, we're doing miracles there uh, until now, three years of uh, chicken. Without the <laughs> Yes. So we, 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 should, we can work on many things. I, work, I don't want to go a lot here. I have a lot of things about uh, my architecture buildings, uh, by John T. or furniture, chairs, and things like that. Uh, I've done uh, with uh, Shirif Ali Khalil here with respect. We raise your hands, Shirif. Okay. <laughs> we had an exhibition and we, we went there, and uh, <coughs> my daughter Daira came and she had an expo. She came and said, uh, by the way, uh, I want you to make a chair for me uh, to put in the expo. I said, there's no time. Uh, we only have three weeks. And if it's such, such thing, you start early. She said, no, 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 please do it for me and all that. So, okay, so we start with that. I sat with Sharif and uh, instead of a chair, we ended up making uh, chairs, tables, we kept doing so many things that, that the factory was full, full of things and then uh, Ravi and my wife would come uh, there and see us working on everything except on the one chair they did. <laughs> Why are you doing this? We want the chair. And you know, I said to she, we start with the chair, we bring the uh, but before we finish it, we get something interesting. So we do another thing, we do another thing, we start doing the place, we do the papers. <coughs> Actually, in three weeks' time, we took a whole pavilion in, in, the, in the exhibition and filled it with biogeometry furniture. But as you see, biogeometry is so uh, is so vast in its applications that if you are willing uh, to spend the next week here, we can go on. Unfortunately. <laughs> We have to go home sometime. So I thank you all very much uh, for being here. And uh, I don't know if anybody has a question uh, or a quick thing before we leave. I'm at your service. Thank you very much. something very special about Dr. Ibrahim Karim. After memory talks, we can go on for days and hours and a lifetime because he has a magnetism that he has absorbed maybe from those places he was healing. So what I propose, we can have a bite and then you can have, uh, unless you have a very, very, very general and urgent question what to ask, otherwise I will propose you that while we have a small cocktail, you can talk directly to him. But anyway, does anyone have a direct question you want to bring to the attention of everyone? A quick bite is Okay, then <laughs> let's go for a bite. And thank you very much for being here.
and the book is there in English and Italian. I have read it twice already. Many answers are in that book. Thank you. Thank you.